So hello, welcome back to the channel, welcome to the bunker and welcome to New Car Day. Uh, I've been dying to share this thing with you. It's completely left field. Darren and I, my partner in Production Bunker, actually bought this car way back in March. But of course, the way that 2020 unfolded, we didn't actually have the opportunity to share it with you yet. So here it finally is. It's probably totally unexpected. And um, no doubt, there's probably a proportion of you going, what the hell is this thing? <laughs> Quite rightly so. Volkswagen XL1 is actually incredibly rare. There were 250 of these cars made. Interestingly, 50 of those were kept back by the Volkswagen Group and only 200 were made available for sale to the public. You got invited to potentially buy one and then you were put into a sort of draw. So you had uh, registered your interest and then at random you would be chosen to buy one. Uh, car launched or went into production in uh, 2013 and uh, between 2013 and 2016, they made all 250. 50 of them, as I mentioned, 50 siphoned off for a future R&D and posterity for the Volkswagen brand, and the other 200 were made available to customers. And this is one of the very few uh, UK-issued cars. Uh, they were actually all made in left-hand drive, and that brings me on to something which helps to summarize and set the context of this remarkable vehicle. You see, on the outside, you might be thinking, what's going on with Jimbo? He's gone all eco and green on us. And uh, while I do think that movement is very important, the interest for me in this car is the engineering of it. Hopefully, by the end of this video, uh, I will have set so much context as to why this thing's special that uh, you'll be like, ah, that, actually, that thing is pretty cool. So what I'm going to do is run down some of the key features of what makes this thing so fascinating from an engineering point of view. Because I believe, engine aside, if you were to read about the specs of this car on a sheet of paper and you didn't know what it was, you would assume that I was talking about a hypercar. So... Take, for example, the whole thing is made out of carbon fiber. Every body panel is carbon fiber, but importantly, it is built around a carbon fiber monocoque, a carbon fiber cell. It weighs just 795 kilograms, and we shall touch on why that's impressive shortly. It has a twin clutch gearbox. It has carbon ceramic brakes. It has magnesium wheels. At the time of launch, it was the most slippery car in existence. What I mean by that was it was the most uh, aerodynamic efficient with the lowest drag coefficient of any production car at that time which was for the nerds out there 0.189 drag coefficient which is just translates to absolutely minimal friction the idea behind this car even though it was designed using hypercar principles whereas a hypercar goes for the ultimate in performance and top speed this approach is the ultimate in efficiencies this is capable of doing 330 miles per gallon in fact, I think Autocar a few years ago uh, managed to document a 340 miles per gallon run. 340 miles per gallon. Just get that in your brain a second. It's just bonkers stuff. Speaking of similarities between hypercar and efficiencies, the engine is mid-rear mounted. Now, where this distinctly separates itself from hypercars is it's a two-cylinder diesel hybrid. The entire package is just over 70 horsepower. So we're going to run down how they've achieved it, why this car exists, and ultimately why we thought it would be a good idea to buy one. Business end of the vehicle. This is boot and engine and hybrid in one. Now it does come with this uh, sort of hybrid charging unit. This is a plug-in hybrid as well. Um, you can choose to carry this with you. I guess if you're going on a road trip and you want to charge it overnight, you can. It's important to remember that it's a plug-in hybrid, not 100% EV. Uh, what's interesting about the diesel engine is that it also acts as a generator as well. It's perfect for driving around town. I mean, in London, you'll benefit from lots of free parking areas. There's no congestion. The tax on the car is zero because the CO2 output is so low. So for driving around town, it's perfect. I wanted to show you this. It's a pretty substantial detail, but it is ultimately a hidden detail. We've got XL1 embossed into a vast panel of carbon fiber. But for me, the detail in here, I mean, just check out this, all of this. And it's that proper fat weave carbon as well. We're not playing around here. This is a like race car grade carbon. Everything is so light. But I wanted to show you this because it just summarizes so much about this car, the engineering, the attention to detail, and also the fascination with keeping things so lightweight. As I mentioned, 795 kilograms. Now, why I return to that figure 
is because it has two components which most engineers when developing lighter weight sports cars try to avoid, which is a hybrid unit and a twin clutch gearbox. This has a seven speed twin clutch box. Both of those components are quite heavy and still they've managed to keep it sub 800 kgs. For me, the majority of the interest and fascination with XL1 is the engineering of it. It's just mind blowing stuff. Let's talk the rear of this car. I actually think the rear and rear three quarters of this aesthetically is my favorite part of it. It's quite a, quite a strange looking car actually. It's got this almost art deco sort of feel about it. It is literally sculpted by air, hence its shape. But I just think the way that they've managed to create this aesthetic, it just looks gorgeous. Now then, these here, um, these are actually, in a strange way, exhausts. It's not the actual engine exhaust, but these actually link in with the airflow that comes from the radiator. And you're thinking, what are you talking about? The radiator surely is at the front of the car. Well, by the way that the uh, air exits, this car, this is actually the radiator. You just wouldn't think it. Air intakes here, and not only is it cooling the uh, engine, but it's also feeding air through the hybrid system in order to keep that cool. And that gets drawn out through the car via a extraction fan, which pulls it out from up here. So while they are vents, they're also exhausts for uh, hot air, not, ex not exactly exhausts from the engine. Uh, that is hot air cooling the hybrid unit. Speaking of actual exhaust, join me way down here. Let me show you this. You see that there? That tiny little pipe, which looks more like your sort of air con drainage pipe or, uh, you know, fuel overflow pipe. That is the actual exhaust from a two cylinder diesel engine. I just thought it'd be Funny to set some context as to some of the smaller components. Actually, that's reminded me of something as I picked myself off the floor. Uh, the car is actually lower than a Porsche Boxster and shorter than a Volkswagen Polo, just to try and give you a, a sense of scale. I mean, just look, I sort of tower over it. It's um, amazing how low it is and how small it is. Uh, there is a fundamental design feature on the inside, which has allowed the width of this car to be so small. Share that with you shortly. Okay, a minute ago, I drew parallels with supercars and hypercars. Now, interestingly, this doesn't use conventional wing mirrors. Volkswagen installed high definition cameras. Now that's not because it's cool, it's because there is less surface area on the outside of the car using a camera versus a wing mirror. Everything that I touch on over the course of the next few minutes is to highlight just the relentless attention to efficiency and eco performance that Volkswagen engineered into this car. The research and development program of this car took 13 years. In fact, I think there was more R&D went into this car than the Bugatti Veyron. But I wanted to tie this in with a uh, hypercar which has launched recently, which is of course the McLaren Speedtail. Quite similar really in the way that the car was designed to punch through the air. Yes, Speedtail is all about its ultimate top speed, uh, but they go about things in a very similar way in terms of reducing drag and friction. So hence, Speedtail has these. And I also have, if we go over here, these wheel shrouds here. Slightly different design on Speedtail, but the application is still exactly the same. It's all about reducing friction, reducing turbulence, and uh, keeping the air nice and smooth over the body of the car. Wheels and tires. Uh, this is where things distinctly separate from supercars and hypercars. Michelin developed a bespoke ultra low rolling resistance tire for this car. Now, if you see the width of them, they are absolutely tiny. The idea, of course, is less contact patch, less friction. It's actually quite an interesting time to talk about these because Michelin launched their E Primacy tire, which has taken so much learning from this tire, uh, which is their green ultra low rolling resistance. That is a mouthful of uh, terms, uh, tire. But, but again, this is to reduce friction. What is fascinating to feel is on this channel, I'm very used to sharing with you cars with big wings and big tires, and wings cause friction and drag, as does the surface area of very sticky wide tires. So when you lift off the throttle in a sports car, generally there's quite a lot of inherent drag and therefore the car begins to slow down fairly quickly. In this, you lift off the throttle and absolutely nothing happens. It literally begins 
to sail. It's the strangest experience. But while we're talking about bespoke Michelin developed tires, we shall talk about the magnesium alloys. Once again, that's for weight saving. Uh, these actually aren't the magnesium component. This is just a sort of dressing cap really in order to make the wheel behind it look nice. You can think of the aesthetic of what the wheel actually looks like as what a sort of spare wheel looks like. You know, that just sort of simple disc with lots of sort of holes in it. Um, again, it looks like that, but it's uh, constructed from magnesium for weight saving. And then this is something which is quite unexpected and another component which it shares with high performance cars xl1 actually runs carbon ceramic brakes and again this is not for lap times or stopping performance it's purely from a weight saving point of view fun fact when this car launched it was a hundred thousand pounds new which makes it cost more per brake horsepower than a bugatti veyron which is <laughs> pretty wild really uh, down to the front, there's actually not a, a huge deal to discuss here other than that is what one of the slipperiest cars in the world looks like. Uh, designed entirely to punch through the air with the least resistance possible. Uh, something that is quite unique about this is that in most cars, the air conditioning unit would be housed with inside the car. However, due to the unique packaging of this, um, they've actually come up with quite a clever solution and it actually sits just in there underneath the bonnet. You can't access it that easily, but it's just an example of some of the interesting engineering term sort of challenges that these guys had to overcome. So as I mentioned, it is a plug-in hybrid, and this is where you plug in your hybrid. Pretty simple, and again, around town, if you can find one of these, not only are you juices up your vehicle, but you're effectively finding free parking too, at least for now anyway. Also, check out the door handle. It sort of depresses all the way into the body of the car, and then, up you lift, yes, butterfly doors. Also something inherited from uh, supercars, hypercars, etc. Ultimately on this car, it uh, contributes to much easier access in and out of what is quite a tight cabin. Now, speaking of which, here's something else. We have this massive carbon sill on display here. Um, you are literally sat inside a carbon fiber cell. One of the things that they wanted to do with this car is make a very narrow body. If I hop around into the driver's side, I shall demonstrate to you how and why they've done that. So you might notice something pretty fundamental with the seats in that they are offset. So they have pushed the passenger back which means they can create a much narrower tub. You see, if the passenger seat was in line with the driver's seat, we would literally be rubbing or in some cases overlapping shoulders, but by offsetting it, it allows them to make the tub narrower, but still give passenger and driver all of the space that they actually need. Now, I'm just gonna close this down. So while the passenger side's fixed, driver side actually, for a car which isn't necessarily focused around pure driving, uh, it has a really interesting adjustability about it. Obviously you can move it backwards and forwards as standard, but it, it actually pivots from the hip. And as a result, you can sort of sculpt it and scallop it so your derriere sits pretty low and your thighs are supported. And oddly, it feels like you're in a proper driver's car. Pretty cool stuff. Speaking of driver's car, uh, there is somewhat of a sort of conflicting situation going on with the gearbox. Now, just before we touch on this, look at this carbon transmission tunnel here. It's just so nice, ultra thin, which gives you an idea of just how uh, small the components are in this car. But connected to this is a seven speed twin clutch box. Now, my typical association with twin clutches is once again in performance cars. However, in this, there's no flappy paddles in order to actuate the gearbox. It just gets on with it itself when you drive it you don't even know it's changed gear. It just sort of floats through the air and just goes through its gears without you really knowing about it. Now, interestingly, despite the fact that this is entirely built by the uh, Volkswagen Group, for some reason, they used a Garmin infotainment screen on the dash here. I'm sure they had their reasons for it at the time. Uh, but if we go into car info, uh, this, is, this is quite indicative, really, of the mindset of the engineers of this car because they have this uh, Think Blue, dare I say it, driving game. Now amongst uh, owners of super efficient cars, particularly XL1, um, that many a screenshots have been shared from a sort of competitive point of view to see who can hyper mile the best, the best efficiency, the most miles per gallon, etc. People have been screenshotting their uh, blue driving scores and sharing them on various forums. And then if we go back to car info, we've got the trip computer here. Um, when we bought this car, uh, it was delivery mileage unregistered 
UK XL1. Super rare. Uh, one of the reasons that we went for it, really, it wasn't necessarily the right timing, but these sorts of cars don't just come along like that. So we thought, while it's there, why not go for it? Um, hybrid mode. So this here uh, shows you how much energy you've got left in your battery right here. And then when the car is actually driving, this becomes an animated um, flow symbol of how the regen from the brakes is uh, putting energy from the engine or the brakes back into the battery. Another fun fact, which is uh, to do with weight saving really, but quite funny, is this little handle here. This is actually a manual window winder. <laughs> <laughs> all about the weight saving. And one tiny little detail is this little handle down here is in fact your door handle. So there it is. I think from the outside at first, particularly if you're a regular follower of this channel, you might be like, wow, this is a, a complete curveball. Um, ultimately, we did buy this for personal reasons. I, I just really like it. I really like the car, what it stands for, but it's the engineering and the significance of what this car represents in its own field. And as an addition to a garage, I just think it's super cool. It's got a great story. And that's what the car for me is all about. It is story, it's engineering stats and just a fascinating example of how far a brand can push something in the opposite direction. This is the same group that brought us the Bugatti Chiron, the Bugatti Veyron. In fact, this and the Veyron were um, developed at overlapping times. As I mentioned, 13 years of R&D. Uh, Veyron itself didn't have that much uh, time, so it just shows how important this car was to the brand. And similar to Veyron, this actually lost Volkswagen money per car. However, how it works is they, they will have learned so much from the techs that they've developed, the patents which have come off the back of this, which will eventually filter themselves into a future Volkswagen and Audi group products. Um, again, fun fact, this is, this is the most exclusive Volkswagen product ever made, which is nuts. I mean, only 200 of them available. And um, what, it, what they managed to achieve with it, for me anyway, is just fascinating stuff. And I thought it would be great to introduce something completely unique to the garage and be able to share different adventures and no doubt appeal to uh, alternative audiences too. So don't worry, we're not going completely eco and green on the channel. I just thought it would be great to share this with you as more of a certain passion project, really. So I'd love to hear from you. The next time you see this, we're going to go hypermiling. We're going to see how far we can get on a tiny amount of fuel. Until that point, please leave your questions and comments and feedback below. I'd love to know what you think, even if you ever heard of this. Um, I've mentioned this car to quite a few people and every answer is the what? <laughs> so let me know, and I look forward to sharing it with you in the next video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I shall see you next time. Ciao.